We begin with a rare attack on Russian soil. Two groups of pro-Ukrainian Russian fighters, known as Freedom of Russia Legion and Russian Volunteer Corps, say they liberated a settlement in the Belgorod region, which sits along the border with Ukraine. The attack left eight people injured and a number of buildings damaged from shelling. Ukrainian officials insisting neither group is directly linked to the government in Kyiv and say both are acting independently. A spokesman for the Kremlin says security forces are working to find what he called a sabotage and reconnaissance group and claims the attack was meant to divert attention away from Russian forces claiming victory in the battle for the eastern Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. Over the weekend, the head of the Russian mercenary group Wagner claimed his fighters had taken the city and would hand it over to the Russian military on Thursday. More details now from CNN's Fred Pleitkin. <gasps> A rude awakening for Russians in the border area with Ukraine. Gunfire and explosions as two groups known as the Free Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, Russians fighting for Ukraine, said they captured one village and entered another in the Belgorod region. Today it's time for everyone to take responsibility for their future, one of the leaders says. It's time to put an end to the Kremlin's dictatorship. Kiev acknowledges the Free Russia Legion are part of Ukraine's security forces, but says Ukraine Ukraine has nothing to do with the incursion into Russia. Putin's spokesman, irate. The purpose of the Ukrainian sabotage in the Belgorod region is to divert attention from the situation in the Bakhmut direction, he said. The raid spoils what was supposed to be Russia's big victory lap. Flanked by his mercenaries, Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin claiming to have taken all of Bakhmut this weekend. Today at noon, at 12 o'clock, Bakhmut has been fully captured, he said. Shortly after, Russian social media channels filling with pro-Wagner propaganda. Mercenaries screaming victory and celebrating with champagne showers. But Ukraine's deputy defense minister quick to deny the Russian claims. The Ukrainian armed forces retained control of certain industrial facilities and private houses in the southwestern area. From the air and from the ground, Bakhmut looks apocalyptic. Any strategic value the town may have had for the Kremlin laid to waste. Ukraine's forces already fighting back, making what they say have been significant gains, north and south of Bakhmut, taking swathes of land back quickly. Bakhmut was supposed to be both strategic and symbolic for Russia in its fight for control of East Ukraine. But Wagner says their forces will withdraw on May 25th after months of ferocious fighting and countless dead. The city will be placed under Russian military control, whose commanders have done more withdrawing than advancing recently. Liam Collins is a retired U.S. Army colonel who is now a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also the co-author of Understanding Urban Warfare. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So there have been similar, if not more limited, small attacks carried out by these pro-Ukrainian, anti-Putin Russian fighters. But is this one, the more recent one, is it, is it significant? And it, is it a step up from previous attacks? And how serious should they be taken when a spokesman tells CNN they want to, quote, liberate our motherland from the tyranny of Putin? Yeah, in terms of the conflict in Ukraine, it's not going to significantly impact the tactical or the operational fight there. Uh, but in terms of right Russia, I, I think it is somewhat significant. I mean, this is a sizable attack by Russian citizens on Russian territory. So Putin doesn't have the firm grip of his populace that he would like the world to believe. Uh, but until they can repeat this and demonstrate that they're able to do this repeatedly, um, then it's not really going to impact the fight. They, they've got to do it repeatedly for, for Russia to divert combat forces from Ukraine to their border. Yeah, well, I guess while there may be trouble brewing at home for Putin, there is victory for him, at least in name, in Ukraine. The battle for Bakhmut, which began almost a year ago with Moscow failed to take Kyiv, uh, ramped up back in August. So assuming for a time that there is some strategic value to Bakhmut, does Putin have the manpower, the resources to be able to use that city to try and move Russian forces further into the, the Donetsk region? 
No, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, this is a, a, a city that really has little tactical and no strategic value. No doubt Putin will try to sell this as a win, but I, I don't think his own populace believes that it's the success that they're trying to sell it as. And if you look at it, really, it's an unmitigated disaster for the Russians, right? As you mentioned, it took them 10 months of heavy fighting just to take this, right, really small city uh, of little tactical value. And in that process, right, lost 10, you know, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of soldiers at the expense of great ammunition that's not easily replaced. Uh, so really, it, it, I mean, their ability to launch and move forward from this is, is, is very debatable based on how much it took just to take this and how long it took to take it. I want you to listen to the Ukrainian president. Uh, he was taking questions from reporters over the weekend at the G7 summit. Here he is. Mr. President, because it's left these Bakhmut still in Ukraine's hands, the Russians say they've taken Bakhmut. I think no. But you have to, to understand that there is nothing. They destroyed everything. There are no buildings. It's a pity, it's tragedy, but for, for today, Bakhmut is only in our hearts. Yeah, there's nothing really left of the city which seems of any value and you know, maybe in uh, Zelensky's heart, but will the Ukrainians now try and actually retake Bakhmut? Is there any value to that or will they just sort of focus on this counteroffensive? Yeah, I mean, Ukraine's shown throughout the war, I mean, they will attack at the time and place of their choosing because they are a much smaller military and do that very effectively. So they defend where they can. They give up territory where they must to preserve combat power to fight another day. And they've done that effectively throughout. So uh, they won't retake what is left of Bakhmut unless right, they feel that there's a strategic uh, position to do that. Uh, but I wouldn't expect them to do that uh, because I think they're going to launch the counteroffensive in other locations where the Russians aren't quite, where, where their combat power is not massed. And, and over the weekend, you gave me Pogrosian, the head of the Wagner mercenary group. He claimed victory in Bakhmut. I want you to listen to part of what he said. And he begins here addressing Ukrainian soldiers. Here he is. 5, 20, 23. Without sarcasm, your guys fought bravely, fought well. And if you follow this path, then you can become the second army in the world. Of course, after the most powerful army in the world, that is Wagner PMC. Today, when you see Biden, kiss him on the top of the head. Say hello for me. Uh, it's notable he did not say the Russian military as being the best in the world, but rather his mercenary group. But if this is, in fact, not a strategic win, but instead a political win, then is it a political win for Pogrosian or for Putin? Yeah, again, I, I would it'd be hard to sell this as a political win for, for Putin at all. If anything, it's for Prigozhin. Uh, he could try to sell it as a win. But then again, this just shows a dysfunction in the Russian military uh, that, that you have this uh, private army that arguably fights better than the Russian military and all the, all the conflict that's causing with him and the generals. Uh, and so it really shows the lack of unity among the, uh, the Russian command. And also, Prigozhin seems to be using this as some kind of springboard to, I don't know, setting himself up as an heir apparent to Putin. Is that how it's being read? I mean, that's how a lot of people are interpreting this. Of course, that's a, a fine line to try to set yourself up as, as heir apparent versus a political rival. Uh, and so he's got to walk that fine line because a lot of rivals may not, may not live to be a rival. Good point. To finish on, Colonel. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your time. You're welcome.